senior advisor with Pivot Health Advisors and formerly was a chief HR officer at Scripps Health. I'm now the chief HR officer emeritus, which means I get to be a little less active compared to the rest of you guys today. We want to welcome to today's roundtable uh, on using predictive data to strengthen workforce and improve performance. Uh, joining us today, we are fortunate to have a terrific group of panelists from a, a var varied uh, backgrounds from different parts of the country. So we on from the West Coast to the East Coast. So a little bit of flavor of everything today. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Lisa Cox Schaefer. Uh, Lisa is previously the uh, Regional One in uh, Health in Memphis, uh, COO and Chief Nursing Executive. In that role, she led patient services, um, an outpatient and emergency room nursing, pharmacy, respiratory and dialysis services, in addition to non-clinical uh, operations. Uh, Lisa has been in uh, uh, key executive roles for more than 30 years from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, more recently, she has joined um, uh, the Virginia Commonwealth University Health System Authority, responsible for budgeting and capital planning and staffing and patient care service areas and so forth. Um, she had an undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina, master's from uh, of nursing from the Medical University of S South Carolina. So she's kind of a Carolina person. Um, <laughs> then uh, appointed to the South Carolina uh, State of Nursing Board and a number of other organizations. So we welcome Lisa to join us. Um, also with us today is Carrie Bear, who's an executive vice president with Integris in Oklahoma City. She serves as uh, the nursing chief executive responsible for the strategic direction of the patient care services. She has a master's from the University of Oklahoma, a bachelor's from the University of Central Oklahoma, uh, and of course, uh, credentialed in a number of key areas, uh, such as a uh, member of the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. She has more than 20 years of experience in, in healthcare and particularly in Oklahoma. Uh, also, we have Al Mateus with us. And Al Mattis is uh, Vice President in Ambulatory Operations and Business Development, COO from Southwest General Ohio. Uh, we could probably add a couple more things onto that title. To, uh, <laughs> to work on. It, it seems short, doesn't it? Yeah, that seems short. And your mind got that way at the end as they kept packing <laughs> things on. Uh, I think they do that to make sure that you, know, you stay busy. But Al has brought an entrepreneurial mindset and spirit to his career from the very start. So therefore, he's focused on developing new services uh, to meet the changing consumer needs. And we know that this past year, they're even changing more dramatically. He has a strong focus on ambulatory and outpatient services uh, and uh, also he's a scientist by training. So he brings strong analytical skills and key business acumen to to the work that he does. Uh, he's been uh, uh, since 07, the VP of uh, uh, Ambulatory Operations and Business Development for Southwest General Health System. And um, he still uh, maintains his fellowship status with the American College of Healthcare Executives, has a bachelor and master's from uh, in healthcare administration from Cleveland State. Uh, he is an alumnus of the, well, I guess it's the T Toledo Leadership Program. You'll have to tell us about that. And then lastly, we have uh, Myra Norton. She's the COO of uh, Arena Analytics. She joined Arena back in 2012. Previously was CEO of Community Analytics. She's been an analyst with Northrop Grumman, senior administration in the College of Science and Technology at Temple, a professional of mathematics and statistics at Towson State and the U.S. Naval Academy, featured speaker across the, uh, many industries, um, and has collaborated with a number of researchers from Harvard uh, to the University of Chicago, uh, member of several organizations focused on innovation and entrepreneurship and stays active in mentoring young college students in the Baltimore area uh, and helping with high school students in the National Foundation of Teaching Entrepreneurship. So with that, we want to get ourselves started. We have a quick hour ahead of us, but much to talk about, and I'd like to make sure that each of our panelists get a chance to offer their insight. You know, today, healthcare is experiencing unprecedented once-in-a-lifetime community health crisis with COVID-19, and that is rapidly 
uh, and continually impacting staffing throughout the country. Of course, when COVID hit, we've watched ourselves go through supply chain issues <clears throat> to reduce volume, to increase cost. And why, while staffing was always important here in the last couple of months, we're really feeling, feeling that acute need in healthcare as this uh, COVID-19 is unrelenting. So I'd like to ask the panel and, and uh, Carrie, if you could start maybe, tell us uh, about the most significant issues and chal challenges you're facing today. Thank you, Vic. Yeah, I would say today, um, you, it, it's interesting how the landscape changes day by day, hour by hour. Um, but right now, um, this this calls perfect timing. It's really our crisis staffing shortages that we're experiencing. So as we continue to surge and take on more and more patients, um, you know, it's kind of unique because Oklahoma, where I'm from, um, we, we thought we were going to have a surge in March and we didn't. So we emptied out our hospitals and we had people on furlough and there's just kind of some disruption there. And now we're going through a very significant surge. And so people are tired, they're exhausted. Um, they're already coming into this with um, just a lot of disruption in their in their day-to-day um, -day life. And so I would say my concern is the well-being of our caregivers, as well as being able to sustain um, a safe staffing model as we continue to, to move through the pandemic. Um, Al, tell us about uh, Ohio and what's going on there. Well, much the same as what Carrie was saying, we're we're right in the you know throes of, of a significant increase. Uh, right now, about uh, forty percent of our current admits are coming in as a result of COVID. Uh, that number is increasing every day, so it's it's putting a particular strain on our inpatient services. But we're also seeing the impact on on our outpatient services as well. Um, and one of the things. <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that we try to do is we're trying to move staff around so that we can keep people working at top of licenses, but how can other, um, let's say for example, physical therapists step in and, and help support some of the things that are hap uh, some of the care that's being delivered on the inpatient side of things. But in terms of the challenges that we're seeing be besides, as, as Carrie had said, you know, the burnout is, is a, a it, it, burnout is real. Uh, weird. And um, we, we've been doing this for, you know, coming up on a year now, and, and it's really taken a toll on everybody. And I think that one of the most important things we have to recognize is the fact that for, for most people, there is no normal. You know, children aren't in schools. Uh, there's nothing that they can kind of hold on to. So we kind of have to create a, some, some life rafts to, to help sustain the, the staff and, and keep them going. And, um, you know, it's, it's the same issues as, as we've had before this uh, pandemic. Costs, uh, how do you, you know, how do you keep those costs down and value? How do you show value to members of the community, to your patients, uh, to insurance companies and, and to the government? And uh, those are things that we're, you know, everybody struggles with every day and everybody is focused on um, how, do, how do you deliver the best service you possibly can for, to care for some really, really sick people right now? Thank you, Al. You know, you brought up a point about there is no normal. As I've visited with various clients across the country, one of the things that has emerged and continues to really, uh, I think, uh, become more ubiquitous across the country and within organizations is just the sheer competition uh, of activities impacting staff, whether it be travelers who now are uh, paying exorbitant sa salaries and causing some staff to shift that direction, whether it be kids are home and you're trying to homeschool, what do you do if you're a single parent? How do you manage that whole dynamic? And it affects the availability of those staff, uh, even if they're not traveling uh, with your own staff, along with other items. And so I'd like, Elisa, tell us a little bit about you know, the things that you're doing to help your organization be staffed and, and, and dealing with COVID. Well, we echo the same schizophrenia that everybody had from uh, the March, uh, you know, uh, impact of thinking it's, it's, it's coming, it's coming. And then uh, it didn't really 
come and we made the decision to not furlough. So we had about eight or 900 people from the ambulatory sector and periop that we started to cross train to do other things. And so, and, and there's new roles, you know, now we have door screeners and we have PPE monitors and we have people who need to learn how to sterilize masks to be reused. And, and so, you know, there were so many other things. We had tracer teams and a lot of different roles. Uh, and, you know, people in ambulatory weren't expecting to work uh, evenings, nights and weekends. Um, you understand that. Uh, and so all of that said, um, we spent a lot of time uh, developing all these models. And so now we're starting to see the big surge for us. We're starting to see uh, a lot more patients uh, with COVID. And so, but now we're all ramped up. And so we've gone from, you know, uh, running our normal census of 700 patients every single day. And uh, somewhere along the way, we decided we thought we needed to renovate um, three units. And so now we don't really have the staff now that the renovations are over and we've got all these negative pressure rooms and no, no ICU staff. Uh, we heard from our traveling uh, uh, vendors that uh, there was close to 20,000 open traveler positions two weeks ago across the country. And uh, the, the rates are, are, we're now out of the market. We can't afford uh, the rates that are going for crisis rates. We have tried to do some things, as you said, uh, we have staff who, um, you know, have children who are not in school that they, um, so we've, we implemented some pretty quick programs for weekends, um, you know, working 24, getting paid for 30, uh, some different kinds of uh, long-term temporary assignments to, to try to really accommodate people's schedules uh, because there's no normal anymore. We all said that and we all feel it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I would ask the audience right now, um, uh, kind of an audience poll and you'll see that that's available on your screen uh, as we think here for a few minutes is um, uh, as we continue to manage through this wave of COVID pan pan uh, pandemic, uh, wh what keeps you up most at night? You know, we all have those things. The nice thing about being emeritus these days is I sleep a little better than the other <laughs> four or five people <laughs> on the screen. I don't wake up in the middle of the night with ideas <laughs> or words. <laughs> Uh, just my dog wakes me up. So, um, uh, but if I would ask you guys to take a few minutes to fill in the poll and there are four or five options for you. Uh, again, the question is, as we continue to manage through the, this wave of the, pa the pandemic, uh, what keeps you up most at night? So we'll take a few minutes as they fill in the poll. Yeah. While you do that, Myra, you might want to comment how uh, this wave has impacted your business as you help organizations, the healthcare, or healthcare organizations across the country? Well, it, it's, first of all, it's been an honor and a privilege to work with you know, healthcare organizations of, across the spectrum, uh, acute care health systems and hospitals, as well as post-acute skilled nursing, senior living, because all, all these sectors have been impacted pretty dramatically. Um, and our work is to help with staffing. So, uh, you know, helping think about how the, the things that everyone on, on this, um, you know, webinar has talked about, how do you redeploy talent that, you know, in areas of a, of a health system where you don't have a need, how do you think about doing, and we've seen, we've, we've helped organizations do that from every part of the health system, taking literally folks in HR, and training them to be screeners, to be greeters, to be, you know, be on the front lines and, and really um, help where they're needed. The other thing we've seen that's been pretty amazing, I think it's something that will stay with us on the other side of this. We are seeing talent coming from other industries into healthcare. So when you think about hospitality and retail and industries that were have been dramatically impacted where there have been massive layoffs, um, certainly you can't you can't move someone from that industry to be a nurse on day one, but we are moving folks to, to provide direct 
caregiving where uh, certification is not required and getting into certification programs. We've seen folks move from hospitality into you know, CNA training programs and then uh, now they're providing direct care. And for many of those folks, it is actually, actually opening a, 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 an industry to them that they did not ever think about being something they wanted to do. And now they're finding great satisfaction with it. So I think in the midst of all these challenges, there are some, some hopeful things that we've learned that if we can hold on to that on the other side of this, we're gonna be much stronger as an industry. Okay, very good. Well, I, if you've had a chance to look at what's coming in on the polls, I can see it on my screen. Uh, we, it looks like most of the folks who responded really have, have commented that uh, the thing that keeps them up most at night, almost 60% are staffing limitations. Uh, the other two areas that they concentrated on um, kind of split both at 20% at each, the health of the clinical staff. So again, related to staffing limitations, but also operational disruptions. So that, um, as you say, the, there's no normal today. So you, what used to be the day-to-day -day operations of a healthcare system or hospital or clinic are very different uh, than, it were, than they were eight, nine, 10 months ago before this thing exploded on us. So uh, interesting feedback from, from the folks on the line that they have very similar things. But given the current environment that we're in, and we all expect that at some point in time, we're gonna reach the other side. <laughs> and of course, in that we, we hear about our vaccines and the UK is a little bit ahead of us now, but still we're supposed to be on the other side at some, at some point in time. Uh, what are you doing today to assure stable staffing as you move through today and into tomorrow? Um, because there have been rumors that the boomers who are left in the workforce are going to get out after this. Uh, some of us on here are right in that group. But um, from that perspective, uh, we know it's going to be a bit different, whether it's telemedicine, whether it's um, uh, different ways people work. And we've already heard Lisa talk about uh, different types of schedules and stuff that uh, are expanding as we go forward. At least I'm going to start with you this time uh, and give Carrie a little longer time to think about it <laughs> than last time. So what are you guys thinking about as you come out the other end? and staffing options and you know i always say when a crisis happens we always want to tighten up and it's the one time we have to be super more flexible and so we're really having to partner uh, with our hr partners uh, a lot uh, just think about how hard it is right now we're so worried about recruiting you know travelers but you know, our recruiting efforts, uh, our students aren't in the hospitals and our recruitment uh, activities have totally been transformed. Uh, nursing's taken on a whole lot more activity and, and all of our virtual recruitment because we've got to have that steady stream of staff um, all the way through. And so we've been doing a lot of that. We also, uh, you know, while it doesn't necessarily bring in more people, uh, but we are putting in some pretty strong HR systems. Uh, we're going to work day. We're going to um, spread API scheduling system across the entire house and also into our payroll. And that's all going to happen. And we're going to convert to from Cerner to Epic in the next 12, 12 months. There's really nothing going on at our place. But all that to say, you know, um, we realize how important having HR tools are needed in a crisis. Uh, you know, we were trying to figure out what to do with 800 people. We don't even know what their normal schedules are because everybody's got their own schedule. Either it's on, you know, a piece of paper or it's in a different system or it's on a spreadsheet or whatever. And so, so it really, um, to me, echoed the importance of having some centralization uh, of processes so that we are better equipped and a little bit more agile. You know, coming to a big 800 bed hospital, um, you know, Scripps was um, 500 beds between my two hospitals, but it didn't feel quite as uh, 
as bumpy as, as this big hospital and, and trying to get your arms around things quickly and, and having enough data to make good decisions is, is super important. So those are some of the things that we're, we're trying to put into place uh, at this moment in time. Okay, good. So fair to say, and, and uh, you commented to me the other day that I may have observed this and I do see it a lot with my clients across the country is the, the shift from HR systems being there for basic HR administration. And those systems have been around for a long time and many are valuable to more operational focused with those systems. And, right. and there's a, a need there and a partnership that helps you in operations be able to manage your organization better. So yeah. um, good observation. Al, how about uh, in Ohio? Well, you know, there. I guess there's two sides of it. It's it's the the continuing operations. What's going to happen afterwards, and then what do you need to do for today, uh, for for the pandemic, while you've also got uh, an underlying need of <laughs> maintaining operations uh, for for those people who aren't just you know aren't COVID uh, related patients. So it the the complexity is is really. Um, it, when I think when we look back at this, I think we'll be amazed at the things that we've been able to accomplish as an industry in terms of transformation. And, you know, a lot of that, none of that really happens without some type of an information uh, source. And, and they come in a number of different ways. As a, we're, we're an uh, independent uh, community hospital. And so we don't have necessarily the, some of the depth that some of the academic medical centers have. Uh, in terms of analytics and uh, just personnel to to do those things. But so we have more of a, a dispersed analytical approach to things. We have a couple of uh, uh, management engineers who, who help uh, guide guide some of that evaluation. But a lot of what we're looking at, you know, are they make or buy decisions? Do we, do we uh, engage certain um, groups of, you know, uh, vendors? To, to help us with this or do we do we uh, transform some of the staff that we have here and give them new roles um, and that's some of the things that we're, we're constantly looking at what what's the right balance of of those things and what makes the most sense for this organization to be both cost effective and to be able to deliver the value that we need to be able to uh, continue to be an independent hospital health system and uh, continue to, to grow. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're constantly, we're in the shadow of both University Hospitals of Cleveland as well as the Cleveland Clinic. And so we have to do things such as monitoring the market for wages. Um, you know, there, there have been some significant um, wage market increases that have happened as a result. And so we have to be able to react to that. Uh, we have to look at the benefits and, and how do our benefits fit the demand for the, the, the staff and, and they're different depending on the generations. It's a generational thing. Um, some of our folks who, you know, the boomers who are potentially looking to, to sunset their careers are, are looking for other things than, than what our uh, millennial or Gen Z staff are looking for. So you have to have that flexibility. And I think that our human resources group is doing a very good job of, of adapting to that. Um, and the other side of it now is is you really need to be attractive to a diverse population of people. How do you bring other people into this uh, this environment who may not have exposure to that or may not have uh, much experience? And um, you know how do you, how do you grow grow the talent pool uh, for for diverse populations to to match the the populations of those that you're serving in the community? And I think those are some of the key. Um, key things that we're always looking at. How do we how do we do some of these things? We have some answers for some of them. Uh, we're developing answers for, for others as, as we move forward. Yeah. In terms of the analytics, I, I think there's no right answer about whether you, you contract or partner with a vendor or try to build your own. Uh, I do have one client that has begun to heavily invest in data scientists to build their own. And they've really did that to, to kind of um, repatriate the lost volume. And so as they dug in, they could find people by payer mix and other kinds of things that they could reach out to and begin to do services. They've since used that now to redeploy their operations. So they have greater capacity for COVID-19, but also 
uh, have, have throughput and operationally more effective in various areas of people who are similarly insured, uh, similar disease states, our service lines and so forth. And they've received some great value from that. But it takes some time to build your own. Right. Uh, <laughs> Carrie, how about in Oklahoma? Yeah, so um, I agree with everything that Lisa and Al have stated. And I would say that in a pandemic, I think the stress it puts on your system, it really highlights your areas of weakness. And so one of the things that, um, you know, we were in the process of putting together was some centralized staffing models and staffing pools, um, deploying different technologies. But the integration of those technologies, um, I think we've got some opportunity there to make it not one more thing, but how do they work together? So in regards to staffing a nursing department, there's acuity, but there's the productivity side. And so. Um, again, on the other side of this, I think we're visualizing now some great opportunities that we have to expand and be smarter in the way that we staff our units. And so um, the one thing I would add that, um, you know, Oklahoma is 46 in the nation per capita in the nursing shortage. So we're not proud of that number, but we're there, um, especially in a pandemic. So we may have got to 50. I don't know. But supply and demand is something that uh, is constantly in my mind. And so we want to start partnering with our academic institutions to, you know, demand is there, but we need to help with the supply side. And so how do we work and produce and support the academic sites to, to help create a model where we can um, develop more nurses that can work in our hospitals? Um, and then just to be sustainable on the other end of this, we're we're pouring our heart and soul into our frontline caregivers right now and building um, resiliency skills that, um, you know, we've, we've had work in that space, but um, moral distress, you know, being visible, open communication, things that I think everybody's probably doing right now, but it does. It's, it's the thing that keeps me up at night is what is our workforce look like on the other end of this and how do we, um, give them a new normal and how do we kind of keep them solid so we can, we will get on the other side of this. And so just what does that look like? Right, right. You know, it's interesting that uh, before this, we begin to see command centers kind of emerge across the country. Uh, I would dare say today, virtually everybody has one going on daily now. Uh, and that that's going to create some interesting analytics as we go forward, because we'll learn a lot for that timely data and collection and how we've had to manage things. So I'm, I'm interested to see what that's going to uh, provide for us in terms of knowledge uh, to change how we, we, we do things in terms of whether it's staffing or our movement of patients and redeployment of staff with that and so forth. So it should be interesting. Um, we'll move on to the next question. And um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Myra to kind of start us off in this, this arena because it is kind of in her uh, wheelhouse, but uh, the use of data analytics and tools and science has expanded rapidly during this COVID-19, whether it be through telemedicine or other kinds of areas. Um, t tell us what you're seeing in terms of uh, data-driven intelligence and predictive analytics and machine learning and other technologies that are helping you solve uh, kind of current utilization and current uh, issues within your organizations because they they are beginning to explode telemedicine i think i've seen people say that it took them two years to get to one point uh, as soon as covid came within six weeks they were up and running and when do and went from you know a, a thousand visits to twenty thousand visits you know it's kind of like uh so it really kind of changed our decision processes in healthcare which sometimes are a little slow so myra what do you see well, yeah, I think what is the the old saying, a necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that you've seen th this happen where folks, you can't, when you're having to make decisions at scale, which everyone on this call is having to do this on a, on a daily basis and at pace, um, you have to have data to, to do that. You can't rely on anecdotal input. And so, I'm seeing a lot of organizations just out to what you were saying, you know, folks that are looking, saying, okay, we need to deepen our own analytical expertise. And I highly, I mean, I'm a mathematician, so of course I'm on, I'm, I'm in favor of, of, of more analytics, but, but I, I encourage that for organizations to have that in house because there are certain analytics that are very specific to an organization, right? And, and you understanding how things work inside your organization 
you know, partnering with a vendor, actually you may lose something there because you want folks to really get the nuances of how you think about staffing and what the philosophy is around uh, care and, you know, all of those pieces. Um, and then there are other sets of analytics that you actually need a broader set of data than you can get inside your own organization. And so that's a lot of what we're, in, in other words, um, if you look at staffing, for example, and if you look at talent and you look at how you build workforces, if you're only looking at kind of what you've done in your organization or the applicant pool that sits in your, you know, that you're used to seeing or the uh, the types of employees and the skill sets that they've brought to bear leading up to this point, um, you miss the broader, you got a lot of holes in that, right? Because there's there's a lot of opportunity to look at what's happening in other industries, what's what, uh, you know, understand a broader set of you kind of what are the predictors of success in a particular role, breaking down roles to say, you know, what what used to be required to do this role is now evolving. We have new roles that we never had to hire for before. So how do we start? So those kinds, I think, you know, what I'm seeing organizations do that I think is really um, it will be exciting on the other side of this. I know it doesn't feel exciting right now. It feels like survival, but it is figuring out what the, you know, to the point you were making out, it's figuring out what are the lines, where do we need uh, broader sets of data? And, and, you know, we need to actually partner with folks that are outside of our entity and where do we really need to have, you know, own this internally. And I think the, the other thing I will say that's just incredibly promising, you guys know, in healthcare in general, so on the clinical side and on the scientific side of healthcare, uh, there's huge leveraging of data, of predictive analytics, of machine learning, of artificial intelligence. That's how we've uh, developed so many of, of these innovations, not the least of which is the vaccines that we're, we're looking you know, at, at uh, disseminating here. Um, that has lagged on the, the business and operations side. And I think there's an opportunity now to really infuse that side of healthcare with some of these techniques that have been leveraged on the clinical and scientific side. And, and the last thing I'll say on it is just in terms of that, that industry in general, what's happening in technology and artificial intelligence and machine learning, the capabilities there are multiplying daily. This is a, so we can do things today analytically that were not possible five years ago. And a year from now, we'll be able to do things that weren't possible today. That's how fast the, the pace of change is happening. So that that to me is really exciting because it means that we're, we're going to be able to figure out, you know, the, hopefully there won't be another uh, global pandemic like like this. But whatever the next crisis is, we're going to be in a better position to to manage it. Well, it's healthcare. There'll be another crisis. So <laughs> that's one thing we can count on is change or something, something unknown and so forth. So, uh, we thought DRGs was the crisis back in right. the day. <laughs> uh, uh, Al, how, uh, give me perspective of, you know, given that you have the background that you do, what, what you guys are using practically today in this arena of, uh, uh, pardon the pun, to, back to arena, but in this area of data analytics, particularly predictive and forecasting and machine learning, uh, what's been what's been working for you guys on the ground? Well, I, as uh, as Myra said, you know, it, this is this whole environment has been transformative in terms of how we are looking at utilization of technology, whether it be in the delivery of care or the, the analysis of operations, um, all the way down to, uh, we, we've used analytics to help us identify what we need to do for uh, staffing levels on, on specific nursing units and, and developing um, key strategies, if you will, and or uh, just operational uh, an operational path to help ensure that we're able to staff in a, in a safe manner uh, to to meet uh, demand as as it as it both uh, waxes and wanes, and and then also uh, to be able to um, cost effectively deliver that care, uh, and and so we have used um, different approaches. Uh, 
from you know from an operational standpoint we've we've used analytics in terms of our our recruitment analyses how we go about looking at um who we're bringing into this organization how we actually bring them in um and and then how do you retain those folks what are the things that you know can you can you start to look at trends from that standpoint we've, we've started to to do those things and um I think one of the key things for us right now is in the direct labor costs. How do we how do we use this information that we're generating on a daily basis, whether it be through uh, standalone systems or our overall electronic medical record? How do we how do we integrate that data into what we do every day so that we can um, provide better value, better care to our patients and um, drive drive the growth of this organization because for for us that's what makes makes southwest general health system happen is growth and so we need to be able to have a a full range of of data analytics and and um platforms that we can we can call upon to to identify every, you know every, again everything from operational to human resources and and uh, to be honest, you know we're we're probably um, we're we're on the learning side of that, and, and you know we we've relied on a lot of traditional methodologies, um, but we we see the value and and the necessity to move into these types of of platforms as as we move forward, and and we're continuing to invest in in that manner. Okay, outstanding. Thanks, Kerry, Oklahoma. Yeah, I would I would say that um, we're probably on the front end of some um, implementation there. So um, big things that we're doing is just looking at predictive modeling around, um, obviously, with uh, retention. Um, so so working with arena on that and then um, again, how we schedule and known vacancies. And so I've seen some really slick models across the country where they have this down to a science that you know your workforce is going to have more call-ins at this time of day, at this time of year, due to whatever's happening in the environment. And so those are the things that we are working to pursue so that we can backfill and be more um, kind of machine learning. So, so some predictive uh, staffing models and how do we make sure that we're bringing in the right resources to cover those holes. So, um, you know, that's, that's, kind of where we're working in that space, I would say for Oklahoma. Okay, good. So when you're talking about that day at that time, et cetera, you're not talking about heads and beds at midnight. You're talking about literally either every few hours or every hour, or every four hours, whatever your interval is, yeah. you're get, capturing data elements at that point in time to know how things are changing. Yeah, heads and beds at midnight is a disruptive word for a nurse. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I've used yeah. that and didn't, had my head taken off. <laughs> yeah, actually, what I mean, like I'm talking about, if we know that our workforce at this specific department is um, young mothers who take off during the summer months because their kids, they want to go on vacation, then we need to be forward thinking and planning the staffing of that. But yeah, yeah. Um, by the by the um you know predicting by time of year by right. day of week etc yeah right it's amazing how many little cycles annual cycles along with other cultural impacts that are there among our staffing and with our patients too as we as we work that and we've known that about our patients but maybe not have not paid attention to staff as we've gone on. lisa <laughs> as you pull everything together in that large health system you have at the university uh, to tell us about what you're doing. Cause it, you mentioned earlier that you're kind of bringing and centralizing and, and re-envisioning your automation and. and right. So um, yeah. So it's funny cause I left regional one, which I would say was an analytic desert. There was no, we used arena to help uh, reduce some of our, uh, our turnover numbers, which were, around 30 percent uh, when I got there um, and uh, you know artificial intelligence seems like a 
do do to me at times. Uh, I always joke about that because uh, it doesn't, I don't understand how it works, but it works and it's pretty amazing to predict things. But here we have so many analysts and so much data, but uh, I would say we don't do, we don't do enough to execute with the data. Um, but part of it is the disparateness of it. Um, so I think centralizing some of those things will help. I just, um, we have a, 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 a software called Strategize uh, that looks at productivity and some other things. And I just went through uh, a video uh, just a few minutes ago, and obviously we're getting ready to do a continuous improvement uh, piece with that. And, you know, it'll drill down to, to the doctor and what kind of joint they're putting in a knee. So, you know, there's so much available out there, um, but but taking the time to really use it and, and and understand it and understand when it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, that's the thing that I see here is when I look at data and it doesn't make any sense. I feel like I'm the only one asking that question. And maybe it's because I'm new. But uh, so I think that those are the big things that we're doing here. Um, you know, I think uh, it's and we also are adding on, we've bought a few other smaller hospitals. And so bringing all of that, you know what that looks like, um, <laughs> Vic, in terms of just joining HR system and all of the uh, electronic records and all of those things to really understand it in a different way, um, I think is, is probably the biggest things that we've been looking at. Half ago, you began to bring together all the data analysts and bring together that into kind of one function to to try to create intelligence for the organization. I know that's a journey. You're not at a destination yet. Tell us how that's gone and what's that's produced for you. So, <laughs> Carrie, did you hear me? Oh, sorry, Vic. I didn't know who you were talking. You were on. Talking to you, talking. Carrie, Carrie, yeah, about the, your analytics function that you've kind of centralized over the last year, year and a half. Can you? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? You were cutting out on the first part when you first. You, uh, over the last year and a half, you guys have centralized your analyt analytics team uh, under uh, a leader and began to pull together all of those systems and try to create intelligence for your organization. I know that's a journey, not a destination, um, but wh where are you and what do you value you guys beginning to see out of that? You know, um, so we've set up a governance structure. So to your point, Vic, we have pulled together um, all of our data, data and analytics under um, clinical business intelligence is what the model is that we're, you know, how we're defining that. And um, there are, um, there's a governance structure. And so I think, you know, Lisa, you said you you get a lot of data, but sometimes you're like you don't quite understand what you're seeing. And so, I think we're in the process of um, getting refined and organizing and getting some foundational key performance indicators um, visualized in that space. And we're, you know, I'm chomping at the bit to kind of get into the fun stuff, you might say. But um, we're we're kind of in that foundational um, validating the data, getting trust in the data. And then from there, getting into more insights. But uh, again, it's it's a journey. It's not a destined. It's not something that's just going to stop. So really excited about that that work that we've got in that space. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. We'll move on to one that's going to probably be a little challenging for all of us to to uh, uh, to deal with because it is challenging for our whole country. We've kind of had a social issue emerge during COVID. So I wanted to ask a little bit about your efforts to retain staff that reflects the diversities in your community. Um, fairly health systems are fortunate. They kind of attract people from everywhere, but it's still an issue uh, for all of us. And particularly as you look at population health and how you uh, reflect your care models and, and what you may do uh, dealing with the diverse populations and diverse uh, staffing. So, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know who to really to start this one, but Al, I'm looking at you <laughs> uh, uh, because you really are community focused and not to say the others aren't, aren't, but as you pick up other facilities, 
you begin to become state focused or maybe multi-state focused. So tell us about your community. So we have been working through the uh, Center for Health Affairs here in Cleveland, uh, in Cuyahoga County. We've been looking at our uh, community health needs assessment and looking at what are some of the key issues around uh, improving the, the health status of, of the community from social determinants to other uh, social issues such as, you know, uh, one of the one of the topics was uh, structural racism and how how that uh, may play into the decision making process. So, um, you know, that 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 has been a key driver for us. We, we completed that assessment uh, this year and then COVID hit and kind of blew everything up as we started to, to roll that out uh, with all of the member hospitals for the Center for Health Affairs here in Cleveland. Uh, but so we're, we're, you know, reconstituting that. We have teams of, of people. We've frozen up, Al. Yes. Hello. I think no, Victor, you're back. You're back. You're good, Al. Oh, okay. Uh, so working through our Center for Health Affairs and, and our population health leaders within each hospital uh, that are part of member hospitals of center, um, we've been looking at from a community-wide standpoint how we can improve some of those, those key factors. Internally, we also look at from, from our own data systems, we look at our employed physician base and are they providing um, you know, what, what are their ordering habits and are they providing the uh, preventive uh, testing to all of these different populations to make sure that uh, we're catching people either mostly, ho hopefully early in their disease process uh, so that we don't catch them at the back end when it's more cost costly, uh, but also just to make sure that various populations um, are, are getting the preventive care that, that they need. and. Um, right now we're actually in that process of using those models and then applying them to a larger population uh, with, you know, not, not within our own serve, uh, people who are uh, coming to Southwest General, but in within the region and how we can apply those models to that population and um, thus affect, you know, a, a even larger population and help improve uh, their their health status. So, um, you know, it, it's it's very interesting, and it, it is, it's an exciting time because we've never had some of that information that's been available Good. to us like it is right now. Good, thank you, Mara. Let me direct to you a little bit, because yeah. uh, you know, in in the technologies, people kind of uh, worry about either coder bias bias or the develop developer bias in what may be in an algorithm. And there's a lot of discussion across the country about, about AI and predictive analytics and whether they, th that validity is impacted because uh, many people come out of Silicon Valley, which look a lot like us here, except for younger. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, is their bias reflected in the code? So tell us a little bit about that, because since you do work in that industry. Absolutely. So the answer is there certainly can be. And it's something that if, if you if you yourselves are building models or you are working with an organization, you want to make sure that um, that they have a, an approach that enables the, the power of data and AI is it can be used for good or evil. Right. I just uh, and the the same um, approach that could introduce bias, what, what you're talking about, can actually be used to strip it out. Um, so because we as humans come laden with bias, unconscious, unintentional, um, where we kind of reinforce historical habits right. and data can do the same thing if we allow it to. The thing that that I'm most proud of that we we work on at Arena is actually removing that bias. So using data to remove historical hiring bias, right. historical biases in, in, in workforces, the way workforces get put together. Um, and so when you can do that using data, you can actually start to change this. You can change the complexion and the dynamics of workforces. And, and I, I love how this, for me, doing this in healthcare, there's so many, this is so interwoven, because when you talk about social determinants of health, Several of the major components of that have to do with um, with you know employment, having ha being able right. to 
have uh, safe, uh, live in a safe neighborhood, have, you know, a, a shelter over your head, all these things that directly relate to employment. And we've worked with a lot of hospitals and health systems to actually help them focus on community-based hiring, which does a couple of things. One, it helps to improve their staffing and, and helps them to fill slots, but it also adds to the mirroring so, so that their, their workforce is mirroring the communities in which they live and work. Um, and I, there is great promise for this, and yeah. it also requires, uh, you know, expertise and a focus and a mindfulness of of where things can go wrong. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear there's great promise. You know, growing up in HR, one of the things we joke about is our leaders have a tendency to hire in their own image, and it would be good to yeah. see that filtered out because we do hire people we're most comfortable with. And, and the, time. the other thing that is so exciting to me about this, and this has been our hypothesis, the reason that we exist, our hypothesis has been when you actually strip that bias out and right. you put workforces together that mirror communities in which they live and work, you actually have organizations that perform better financially, operationally, um, quality out. And that is what is happening. That's what we see happen. So yeah. as organizations start to improve their diversity, they actually are outperforming on operational metrics. So, you know, there's a lot to be hopeful for here. That that leads to the next question. I'm glad you brought that up because that that those hard economic dollars help decision making when you go through the process. But, you know, in healthcare, we have a lot of capital pressures. We're a capital intensive business. And uh, uh, how do you determine the ROI or the value of the use of an application like data analytics or other kinds of operational focused technologies. You know, how do you justify that? Because many times it's, well, we think this is what it's going to do for us. Uh, and when you look at that compared to other capital projects that have revenue or direct cost savings, these are really, at least initially, a little softer. Tell us how you go through making those decisions in your organization, particularly with around these areas of the analytics and uh, data science and predictive, uh, predictive forecasting and so forth. And Carrie, let me start with you. Yeah, you know that's a that's an interesting question, Vic. Um, because truly, I feel like these these are tools to augment the work that that we're doing. And I know there's investment. There's a, a large investment in securing those analytics. And so. Um, you know, kind of the approach that we have is just ensuring that they are aligned with our strategic initiatives and are going to produce the outcomes and kind of guide us as a tool to get to the end goal. Um, but um, as far as is kind of measuring that ROI there, um, I need to think on that one a little bit more. That's a good, that's a really good, good question. Yeah, it's a challenge for all of us. Yeah. Uh, and I think in any industry, really, because the promise of what technology brings you, you know, we've realized a lot, but there are folks will tell you that every time we do an IT project, there's a big promise, but they're not sure they see it on the bottom line. It's there, but we're, we're at, we struggle measuring it. Uh, Lisa, since you have capital budgeting, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> Your group, tell, tell us how you guys try to measure that. Well, I think that, uh, you know, certainly, yeah, I come from a hospital where we had no capital budget. So when I got here and they said, well, we've never had a request denied. I was like, what? I haven't had one approved in four years. Um, we were very poor in Memphis. So uh, all that to say, but, but ironically, uh, to me, um, we don't always want to look at cost avoidance as uh, as an ROI, but the reality is if you've got a 30% turnover in nursing and you have spent uh, countless hours and dollars orienting people only to have them walk out the door uh, or not even make it through orientation uh, or uh, all of those things it, it, and then to bring in agency labor on top of that it is super expensive and uh, for us uh, as we think about how to um, you know get our ROI if you will on some of the, the those kinds of pieces, uh, the numbers are, are staggering. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you only look at productivity, but you don't look at the cost of productivity, then you you really have made another error in, uh, 
And so all that to say, we've been looking at a lot of analytical tools um, here, and we have a lot at our disposal and, and more analysts than you can shake a stick at. Uh, and um, but, you know, they're all looking at different things and they all don't always measure things. And so they put in a lot of numbers but they don't always understand the operations behind the numbers. Uh, and so I think that that's the other piece and the opportunities for us is, uh, and that's probably the one thing that, uh, you know, I replaced a CPA here. So you'll find that a little humorous. They put a nurse leader as a, as a, the person dealing with finance uh, and budgeting and staffing, because um, I understand the numbers, but I also understand what's behind the numbers. Right. And that's, that's the piece that I think we, struggle with uh, here, you know, our biggest challenge is, is that um, from a capital side is, is to be a lot more in sync because we're so big and there's so many different divisions that, you know, last quarter, somebody asked for the same thing that someone's asking for this quarter. Well, why didn't you mention it last quarter? We could have ordered it together and have been cheaper, you know, those kinds of things. So right. all that to say, um, I think uh, just the, uh, sheer size and complexity of this hospital makes it a little bit more challenging. But um, to me, we've got to look at at uh, how to streamline things. Um, you know, I we you'll love this. We have an 18 percent non-productive factor for nursing here. And I, I've never been allowed more than 10, even in my scripts days when I worked with you, um, Vic. But all that to say, you know, they have calculated out that a new grad really is only productive about five months of the first 12 months, five. Uh, you know, we have to figure out ways to make that different. And right. to me, it's using more simulation. It's, it's, it's using a different kind of integration uh, because that's, you know, five months is not enough right. uh, for productivity. So, um, Especially if you've got productivity, as you mentioned earlier, that go north of 20 percent and your replacements are only, particularly the new grads, only productive five out of 12. That really is a huge cost. Uh, the cost yeah. of labor, I think, is a good way of measuring the cost of your labor. And when you look at uh, productivity, uh, of way to kind of bring that that into a more manageable per unit uh, way of justifying what, what we may be investing in. Well, let's ask our audience a little bit. So another poll question is uh, for the audience, when you guys are evaluating investments or new innovations to help you stabilize workforce, uh, what's the most important metric you use uh, to assess ROI? And so as they kind of reflect on that a little bit um, and begin to fill out the survey, um, ask you, Myra, what do you, have you seen uh, people use and they go through these decision making. Yeah, I think it, look, it, 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 it's hard and it can be uh, a little overwhelming to get to, you know, what, how do we actually measure the impact? But I think it's doable and you also don't have to make it rocket science. So if to, to the point of, you know, if we're, if we're deploying a scheduling technology and we're saying, you know, what do we should be able to answer the question? What do we expect to be able to see on the other side of this? And then, you, you know, you, you figure out, all right, what are the metrics we need to measure? When when we look at, you know, the work that Arena does, it is all about labor costs. So it is, OK, if we are reducing staff churn so that we're not having to fill slots multiple times, you know, over a year or two years, we should see that impact in agency spend in overtime spend. Right. And it's it's like getting down to what are those components? What are the components? What are, what are the costs that we incur in addition to the, the pro, you know, productivity metrics are one piece. But if, to, you know, to what um, Lisa said, if you don't look at the cost of productivity in in combination with that, you're not really getting a complete picture. So, um, you know, that's how we see folks look at it. And then looking at things like um, occupancy or, you know, sort of the revenue side of this as well. What is the cost? You know, are we having to either turn away people because we don't have appropriate staffing? There's there's a revenue impact um, for, for some of these pieces as well. And so I think it's just looking at what what are the, the KPIs that we expect to see moved 
and then you, you got to measure them. Okay. All right. I'm having a hard time getting the, uh, my, the question to come up on my screen. Is anybody else experiencing that problem? I know. Actually, it says 50% uh, were worried about quality and outcome, and the other 50 is economics metrics. Okay. All right. Thank you, because that didn't come up on my screen. So um, split between economics and quality and outcome measures that people are using, which I think makes sense. There are things in the quality area that sometimes you can't get to economics that justify an investment as we go forward. Uh, but I still think that the more we are able to uh, get our intelligence and data and kind of centralize and bring together those things, we can quantify those over time. It's, it's a learning process, just as Lisa said. You know, when you're looking at staffing, when you begin to look at the cost of, if you're using a lot of agency and other kinds of things, uh, it can justify an appropriate investment as we go forward. So one last question as we close, get ready to close, um, and I'm going to turn this over to Myra because we're, we're almost done, is um, uh, considering what you've heard today, Myra, take a few minutes and uh, tell us a little bit about ARENA and how you're going about uh, your approach to help health core organizations. Well, I think, thank you, Vic, and thank you to all of, of uh, my fellow panelists. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I think we've pretty much covered it. I don't think there's much more I can add to what these good folks have already said about the challenges that we all are facing in healthcare across the country. Um, and I, I just hope that maybe some of the ideas that were raised here today are helpful to someone out there who's, who's facing them themselves. So okay. thank you all very much. Very well, I want to thank each of you taking your time out today. Uh, to help us out and to take this on as we kind of move. This is one area that is radically changing uh, in all industries, but I think in healthcare, we're beginning to catch up with others of the use of this technology. And particularly as we think about how to redeploy or the new roles that are emerging that Lisa talked about uh, across the organization or the sheer transformation that Al has mentioned that is taking place across uh, organizations as we go through this. So uh, again, thank you to the audience. Thank you to all four of you for joining me today. And we want to thank uh, uh, Arena and the Center for Health Affairs, which I'm learning more and more about. And uh, hopefully I'm going to learn even more about, uh, sounds like a, a really great organization there in Cleveland. So thank you all. Thank you all.